Welcome to Customer Success Foresight, where we interview top global thought leaders and ask them about the future of customer success. On episode three, we are so excited to have Bumika Aurora, founder of Rough Day Services, a coaching firm helping CSMs supercharge their career. Bumika, thank you so much for jumping on with me today. I'm really excited to learn more about you and have our audience listen to your perspectives on customer success and all the great changes and what we're, what's coming up on the horizon. So before we, we kick off, we'd love to have you do an intro for everyone and on your background and what you're up to right now. Yeah, absolutely. Super excited to be here, Sagar. Um, you know, I think what you're doing at Foresight is um, truly amazing and it's very innovative. So um, yeah, happy to be here and provide background and insights um, into the, the areas that you're looking for. So um, my background, so nobody actually comes from customer success. You might already know that. Um, I started off my career in finance and consulting. Um, and over time, I realized that the part of that that I really enjoy is just working with customers, providing solutions. Um, so I am originally from uh, Zambia, which is a small country in South, Southern Africa. I moved to the Bay Area um, to pursue my MBA and just get into the startup space. Um, and right after that, I had my first customer success role, which was not even called customer success. Um, but eventually we realized what I was doing was customer success and that sort of, sort of, um, that role came about for me. Um, and yeah, I've, I've been in the industry for quite a while in customer success, um, at different companies in enterprise CS role as head of CS, um, as well as a VP of CS. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to just provide more insights, insights into it. Uh, currently I'm actually running my own, uh, coaching and consulting practice in customer success, actually. So I'm trying to give back to the community, trying to, um, be a part of what's next in CS as well. Awesome. That's great to hear. And I think this is a good starting point. You mentioned that nobody really starts in CS or it's rare for folks to start in customer success, but many professionals and seasoned veterans like yourself are drawn into it or stay there because it's so important. One thing that really struck me in a prior conversation is core values that every customer success centric company and customer success manager should have. So can you talk to me about what do you think are the core values that customer success should embody in an organization? Yeah, and I think that this is such a great question because it kind of changes over time. I think there was a time where we talked about, um, you know, attention to detail and empathy, and it's great to still have all of those things. But I think the next question is what else? Um, and I think one of the the most important values that you guys have at at Foresight as well is intention and working with intention. Um, and that's going to be continued to, that's going to be an important value to have as you continue to grow in customer success. What exactly is your intention with your customer? What are you trying to do for them? Um, and this is for both the company and the CSMs working at those, co at those companies. Um, other than that, uh, I think this is some, this is another topic that's discussed pretty widely is that churn is not just a CS or goal. Um, retention and churn is something that the company should look at as a whole customer success is a company goal, not just a customer success departmental goal. So if that can be embedded into the value of the company saying we are customer centric, um, we want to lead with customer led growth, which is a term that uh, had been coined recently by, um, by Catalyst. I think that it, it will be more human centric and customer centric as you move forward. So just being very intentional, knowing that you can lead with, customer-led growth rather than um, trying to figure out things on your own <laughs> and really listening to your customer and figuring out what's important to them. Totally. It's, it's a really fascinating point about churn is not just a CS priority. It is a company priority. I've seen a lot of organizations shifting how even CS teams are structured, how they're incentivized from an NRR model to a GRR model, right? Just focus on gross retention and then the sales team being focused on inside sales instead of account managers, farming the existing client base and determining if there's opportunity. So I'm curious where you see the pendulum swinging right now from if CS is responsible for everything versus compartmentalized some responsibilities for sales. What, what do you think is the, what are leading companies doing right now? How are they structuring their CS organizations? Yeah, it's with the economy just shifting right now, um, I'm seeing a lot more of the sales component being introduced for CS. 
Um, and it was always sort of there because when you're responsible for a customer, you're responsible for retaining the customer, retaining the revenue that they bring within the company. Um, but now what's happening is that CS is becoming more involved as a revenue driver. Um, and that's probably not going to change. I'm also seeing a lot of companies moving away from, you know, client success as a, as a core to account management. Um, and I think we're just sort of figuring that out on what it should be called and what those responsibilities should look like. But across the board, um, there's definitely more demand for CS to be involved in um, understanding what net retention is and what they can do to drive that loyalty and net retention. Um, as the economy has changed, you know, revenue has become more important than ever. Um, and studies show that uh, the majority of revenue comes from existing customers. So there was a study done by Small Business Trends in this year, actually, where they looked into the probability of selling to existing customers 60 to 70 percent. But the probability of selling to a new prospect is actually 5 to 20 percent. So just based on where the industry is shifting to, you are going to want to invest more in your existing customers drive loyalty with them, drive retention and revenue with them. I love the stats and the research. It's always uh, great to validate some of the stuff that is happening in the market. Yeah, and... you can see me glancing to the right. I'm like, I want to get this <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but there's so many studies that are done. Like it's not just the small business trends. There are so many studies that show that majority of your revenue is going to come from existing customers. Absolutely. And it, yeah, it, it, Economies of scale are, are great there too because of customer acquisition costs, you've already eaten that, right? You've already invested that. So your CAC to LTV ratio is, is going to be a lot higher if you're just focusing on your existing customers. And it's it's really interesting what how customer companies are structuring that. One one other question, which I, I hadn't sent to you on the list before, but I'll put you in the spot here, is what is your perspective on product-led growth as a motion right now? And there's so much focus on product-led growth and then digital CSM or tech touch or low touch, right, as a complement. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll just pause there. What are your thoughts? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because all of these terms don't really work in silos. If you look at customer-led growth, you can't only listen to your customers and then do nothing about it. If you look at product-led growth, you can't just work on your product in silo and then do nothing about what the customers are asking you for. So um, I, it's, it's very, like, companies will always say, oh, we're one or the other, but really what you're doing is having a more human centric approach where you're listening to your customers, you're uh, informing your product roadmap based on what your customers are saying. Um, and then you're, you're leading with that rather than saying, Hey, we're going to, we're going to just build something in silo. So it usually is, it, it's kind of like a cycle, right? So you'll build something um, and then you'll run it by your customers. So they're sort of like your design partners or they're going to inform you on what's missing or what more they'd like to see. So you do have like a, a minimum viable product that you will start with. You're not going to start with nothing. But then as you pivot and you grow, it's going to be a cycle where you ask your customer, come back to your product, inform the future of the product. And that's going to continuously um, continuously happen. So whether it's product-led or customer-led growth, you kind of do have to work together with the two, regardless of what what your value is as a company. Um, it's such a great question because I sometimes I, I also shift to product-led. I'm like, maybe it should be product-led because if you don't have enough of a, a product um, insight or if you don't have enough of a product-led growth, you're going to end up not being able to evolve your product in time for what the customer is looking for. So you sort of need to give and take on both sides. I, I totally agree with that. And I think people get so enamored with certain types of philosophies, product or growth being one of them. I think it, it, it fits for some people, but ultimately in, in the world that I play in, which is enterprise sales motions, large average sales price of six figures and above, you know, your product actually matters less, hot take, than, than, rel than relative to other companies because your customers are a lot bigger. They've got hundreds of products. They've got thousands of problems. And your product only exists in the context of their problem. And it, it's a different dynamic, right? Rather than companies that might be, you know, like an open AI, for example, or chat GPT. That is pure product-led growth because the product is so good and so transformational, it, it's just growing naturally. But 
not every company is going to be even able to touch ChatGPT from that perspective, which is fine. But you have a yeah. different value prop. You understand the nuances of how a hospital should work. And so you've purpose built your technology for that. ChatGPT is not verticalized, right? They've not, right. not built it for the nuances of your customer. So it's you can be really successful here, maybe not as successful here, but you have to be honest with yourself, I think, as a company and where your skill sets are. And I love that example of ChatGPT as well, because yeah. if you think about it, what they built is a baseline or an MVP, right? They built that minimal viable product, which others are building on top of. Um, so what they've done is they've released something in the market where you're like, oh, I can use AI in this way. And then there's so many companies that are building AI for specific, like you said, for health tech or, um, you know, like travel tech. And that's that's dif that's the difference between something like ChatGPT versus um, a product that's there to serve a customer. But even with ChatGPT, I think OpenAI now is trying to be very intentional on how they're serving their paid customers. So think about that as well. Like they're they're not just going to continue building that in silo. They're definitely getting that feedback from their customers and saying, "Hey, what what can we do different? Um, you know, what where are the where are the problems that are happening now with with all of the data that they're feeding into ChatGPT? How they can change that? And that's not happening in silo for sure." Yeah, totally. It, it, and it's an evolution. It's not an either or. I think it's it's a continuous spectrum, right? And you have to figure out where do you fit, what's right for your business and for your market at, at a certain point in time um, and not get washed away by <laughs> the trendy things that are happening. Exactly. Um, you, you'd ask me something else about um, just digital CS. Uh, and I was going to add this, that some of the expectations from customer success outside of it becoming a little more salesy is that there's a lot of community-led growth as well. So this is another one, right? Community-led growth in addition to product-led and customer-led growth, um, where if you have a very um, if you have a very basic product that a lot of people can make, well, how are you differentiating yourself? It's through building communities. It's through building that tech touch that you're talking about through a digital CS program. Um, this is something that Salesforce did actually in the earlier days. They they differentiated themselves through building a community, there were so many other CRMs out there. Why did they differentiate themselves? It's because of that. They were able to build a community that people subscribe to. And at some point you're like, oh, Salesforce is the leader. Um, even though so many people did what they did before they came about. So um, yeah, that's that's an important growing part of, of CS is just how do you build a community? How do you um, coin digital CS for in a way that you can reach as many customers as possible and bring value to them? Absolutely. It, it's the trailblazer. I was actually listening to the woman who started the trailblazer program on a webinar a couple of weeks back and they, they, they figured out a huge need because there's a massive amount of sales force, not just users, but members of a sales force. And how do you, how do you start to map the needs collectively of your ecosystem? And I think it's brilliant what they did for a horizontal platform like Salesforce to create a vertical for sales, right? At the time, it wasn't obvious. Today, it's like, of course, but it, it, I think it's knowing your audience. So that, that's a really good example. Um, so I guess it, along the lines of Salesforce and, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they started that. Uh, can you talk to me a bit about how you've seen the expectations for customer success change over the past 10, 15 years? And ultimately, what does that mean for the role today? Yeah, it's, it's such a great question because um, in the early days, success was almost synonymous with support. Um, you were basically glorified support in a way where you're going a little bit from reactive to proactively reaching out to the customer saying, hey, did I solve your problem? Did I, did I do what you wanted me to do? And then that sort of transitioned into let's be more consultative with our customers. Why can't we be proactive? Why can't we do success plans? Um, and that's sort of the evolution of support to success. Um, and so in the last 10 years, it's gone from being um, more of a support slash maybe we need to be operational to um, let's be more intentional with our customers. Let's be more consultative to now what else can we do to understand the future business impact of our customer, of, of our product or service on a customer? Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to call out foresight for that because um, we're one of the things that we, we're trying to do better in customer success, and I'm seeing this as a community, is understand 
and measure verified outcomes, which is really hard to do. Um, traditionally, customer success metrics have been around, yes, net retention for sure. I mean, that's like the sales component of it. But then we have NPS, which is, I have such a love-hate relationship with NPS because it's done really well and it's also not done really well. Um, and finance teams, I was actually talking to a finance leader the other day who was trying to use NPS. Um, and they're like, I just don't get how this is how how this was developed and what this means for the company. And then you use that as an investor metric. Oh um, my investors are investors are looking at NPS going, I don't know if this is if this means something good about the company. And you're using that single metric to really drive customer success and net retention. It's it's not going to work. Um, so you need to have verified outcomes. You need to understand your customer's business. And how do you do that is when you listen to your customer and they actually tell you what's valuable to them. Totally. So NPS rant. I uh, I definitely on the on the cancel NPS train. And it's funny because I was looking back at where did NPS come from? And there's a 2002 Harvard Business Review article that was talking about how the CEO of Enterprise the rental car company had just launched this net promoter score thing, right? And all these other CPG or consumer companies were saying, wow, yeah, we need that as well. And yeah. so NPS was designed for a GIF or a peanut butter company. Be like, hey, how do you like our peanut butter? Oh, you like it? You would give it to a friend? Perfect. That, that's good. It's not built for enterprise software companies. It's just not. And it, it's, a, it's a bad barometer of it. Uh, and it's not actionable. You can't do anything with it. So I wanted to to, to vent on that for a second because it, it's a, a nerve that a lot of CS professionals are having to deal with because somebody's telling them, what's our NPS? But you're wasting your, your cycles if you're trying to focus on that. Um, but to your point, you know, verified outcomes, I appreciate you saying that about, about our solution. But I think something I've noticed, curious to your perspective on this, is for sales, we go back to Salesforce and Trailblazer and that. Sales has always had a very clear objective of what the metrics are. If it's not measured, it's not managed, right, Peter Drucker. But in CS, there hasn't been a great equivalent of what, what do you measure? What are we trying to achieve? Initially, it was adoption, happiness, maybe NPS, retention. Okay, now you're introducing upsells. You're introducing expansions, introducing cross-sells. That's like 20 different metrics. And yeah. it's it's hard it's hard to map to okay how much revenue did you bring in okay let's optimize for that well here there's a lot you could optimize for so yeah I I I don't know if there's a really a clear question here for you but what hey. what do you think yeah go go for it I was just gonna say um yeah it's so right right there's so many different metrics and often what happens is the leaders themselves will not know what is the most important metric for CS but then when they deliver on something, they'll say, oh, but then what What? What about this other one that you didn't deliver on? And CS is kind of constantly in that stress mode where they're like, I need to be, I need to be perfect in all of these areas, which is expansions, cross-sales, adoption, engagement, engagement. NPS. It's um, and it, it's crazy, but that I think that's why I was kind of moving towards the, the, the verified outcomes, um, you know, metric, because that is something that your customers are telling you, right? So when you talk about sales and CS, sales and CS, um, again, sales has their own metrics to work with. Um, it, it's very, very clear. CS does not. But at the same time, you're working towards building the same thing for the customer, which is, hey, can we get customers? Can we keep them happy? Can we get more revenue out of them? That is the same goal, if you think about it, for both of them. Um, and that's why when you build something like a mutual success plan, it's important that sales and CS are on board for, for that, right? Um, but at the same time, they'll disagree because sales will say, no, this is what's important to us. CS will say, this is what's important to us. But what's important is actually what the customer wants. Um, yes. So who's going to inform that is the customer. It doesn't matter what sales and CS think. At the end of the day, it's it's what the customer thinks that's important. So um, yeah, so that's why I, I'm such a huge advocate for measuring a success plan or measuring uh, verified outcomes based on the success plan that you build with a customer versus what you've coined internally as the term for success, which is like you said, NPS adoption, all of those things. It's also really hard to measure adoption for most companies. Um, I know that again, just kind of going back to product led growth, uh, you can look at the product, gather data from the product to measure adoption, 
Um, maybe if the customer showed up for onboarding, you're like, okay, they're engaged, they're they're using it, right? And that's basically what you're looking at. But there are so many times that you'll you'll think that the customers adopted the product and they're using it well, um, and they're on the brink of churning because they're looking at competitors. So you have no idea until you actually speak to a customer or they've informed you um, on what value you're delivering. So adoption is a good metric to see that the customer is engaged using it, knows how to use that product. But that I feel is more of an onboarding or you know that 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 um, traditional metric again for CS, which is customers using our product. But what else, right? What what about the future? Yeah, this is a really interesting thing because. What I hear all the time from CS leaders is we had great product adoption or product usage, but they still churned. Okay, well, they were green in your current health score paradigm, but they value was red. Well, you missed that. That was a blind spot, right? I think product-led growth works really well to track value. If you have one use case, if you have a single use case, then yeah, more usage of that product is great. But it, there's not a great way, I'm a little bit biased, <laughs> but today to track use cases, right? In, in for customer success teams to say, what are the use cases? That's qualitative data. That's not quantitative data. And there hasn't been a framework to capture that. So if you're a multi-use case company, which most companies are selling into enterprise, relying on just product usage is not a great m- measure of, it, it's not a good measure of value because you're not looking at the holistic picture and you're going to be missing out on a, on a lot of areas. So yeah, I think I think there's a moment here to redefine what adoption actually means. It's similar to is product-led growth right for me, or is is customer-led growth right for me? It's like, well, what does your solution do, and who does it support? And then you can determine what are the right metrics and how you should define adoption, and and what that actually means. So, yeah, really, really like that thought. Um, yeah. yeah. Anything else on that before we we keep going? Yeah, no, I was just also going to say, because you you mentioned um, depending on what your product does, right? Um, Usage-based products are significantly different from pure subscription products. Um, and I think that it's important, like you said, if, you, if you're a mix of both, which most companies are, it's you'll pay for subscription and you'll have some usage base, which will be sort of like an add-on. Um, or it could be that it's just pure subscription, you get access to everything and that's it. Um, but yeah, if you're, if you're a usage-based product, you definitely want to track that adoption. And, you know, I think it's a, it's a good metric to have in addition to, um, to measuring your verified outcomes. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that it's not that something that we're, we're throwing out the window saying, don't track usage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said product, you've got to track usage. Totally. And I, and I think that's a key point here that you're bringing up is that there's nuances to all this, just because. There's no silver bullet, we all know that, but I think to be able to understand the nuances of your solution, your offering, your market map to the right things, that's a great point. Um, aligning your the metrics to how people are consuming or paying for your thing, if it's usage consumption-based, there's a much higher tie-in to product usage than if it's not. Um, Especially if it's like point. a B2C, B2C sort of model, um, you probably wanna be more on the consumption and usage uh, side of things. Yeah. One hundred percent. Cool. Well, want to take a slightly different direction here. Uh, for those of you who may not know, Bumika runs a consulting company called Rough Day Coaching Services, and she's working with a lot of folks in transition in their career. Are they trying to break in to customer success, trying to break up into leadership roles, or ultimately uh, grow their CS career? So, would love for you to spend a couple minutes sharing any advice or any frameworks for folks who want to break into CS? Maybe we start with folks breaking into CS and then we can talk about folks who wanna grow in CS. Yeah, no, perfect. Thank you for making that introduction. <laughs> so I'm definitely figuring things out as I go along as well, um, just by talking to, I, I would say that we are a customer-led growth company for sure, <laughs> um, because we listen to um, our, our coaches and we, we try to understand what they're asking for, as well as listening to companies that are hiring for CS. Um, and we basically came up with um, three profiles, which is, and again, rough day coaching, you can probably see that we're really into dogs and, and I'm definitely. <laughs> <into that>. Yes. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so our profiles are based on dogs as well. So we have the pointer, which is um, somebody who's trying to break into CS. So you're basically exploring what CS is. You're kind of pointing in different directions going, hey, is it this? Do I want to do this? Do I want to do that? Um, and I think for for that 
profile of a person who doesn't know much about CS, but is trying to break into it for whatever reason, like maybe it's a, it's something that you heard about or was interesting, or you just heard that, you know, it pays well and it's an easy um, break into tech, which it is in, in some way, but it, it's easier than others, but it's definitely not easy today. Um, I would say that for, for the pointer um, the profile, you want to try and understand what it really means to be in CS before you get into it. Um, you know, bust the myths that are out there for CS, because I, I do get a lot of people asking me, um, hey, like, is this similar to relationship management? Which in some way, yes, you know, relationship management comes as a part of it. But like we were talking about earlier, if you don't have the right mindset into understanding metrics and how you're going to be measured, how the customer is measuring you in terms of value, um, really understanding what annual recurring revenue is if you're breaking into SaaS, um, net retention, all of these things are important terms that you need to understand when you're breaking into CS and what that means for you as a CSM, how you're going to be measured. Um, and, and a lot of times people who are breaking into CS are not wanting to do sales. It is going to be a, a component of it. And it's not to look down on sales. Honestly, if you are a good salesperson, you will be successful in a lot of different fields. So just know that if you can talk to a customer, just understand their problem, um, really figure out the solution that they're looking for, that's where you could find success. So if that's not you, I don't think that CS would really be the right fit for you because um, you're you're not looking to work together with a customer to deliver value for them to the next level. Um, and then the the second thing I was going to say with um, the the other two that you mentioned is basically somebody who's trying to move up into CS. Um, maybe they're a CS associate or specialist or CSM, and they're trying to get into a senior CSM role. Um, the the difference between a senior CSM and a and a, a CSM is usually the strategic piece um, on how well you work with a customer to deliver the next thing. So again, in the first um, aspect that we were talking about was to understand what that means. Now it's time to put it in practice. Um, how, you know, what is the customer looking for? What is the business impact on them? What, what really drives value for them? And then right. I think those user stories really understanding you know, how you deliver that value as a, as a CSM. Um, and then internally also taking more initiatives, you know, mentoring people in your team, just like start acting as a leader, um, even if you're not a leader right now. There is nobody that's going to stop you from acting like a leader. You don't have to be a manager to be a leader. Um, and that's something that we often try and train on is try to lead, um, which is learn, engage, um, uh, assimilate and develop. So try to lead even before you become a leader. Um, yeah. And then the last thing is you might be a CS leader or you've kind of been thrown into a leadership role, a manager role, um, and you're just sort of lost. <laughs> so that happens a lot of the time because, um, you know, there's just a need and the, per the person who is doing their job best will often be put into a people manager role um, and they're not really built for that. You know, some people are, are great individual contributors and they do really well. And, and they're put into a people manager role without even asking, hey, is this what you want to do? Do you want to manage people? Um, and that becomes really complex as well, because a leadership role is about developing internal relationships and understanding your, your people more than even customer success. So um, understanding customer success is absolutely important and understanding the metrics. Again, I'm going to go back to the metrics. How does that impact your role at the company? What are you actually do, doing to drive revenue as a CS leader? What are you doing to drive value to your company as well as also understanding the people, the relationships, how they, they link together? So you have to develop really, really strong relationships within a company, um, whether it's sales, marketing, you know, the revenue piece, and then also with the engineering product piece um, to make sure that you're delivering value. It's it's a very complex role. And I think um, sometimes we feel like it's, it's an individual role and you can do it on its own, but no, you have to understand how it fits together with the rest of the company. Um, it's one of those, those roles where you probably have to talk more to um, your colleagues, then you have to talk to customers if you're in that direct position or a leader position.
Totally. Yeah, what you're saying speaks volumes of, I think, where the industry is right now. There's there's so much variance and nuance that depends on a lot of the factors we talked about, your product, your solution, the market. It's not like a sales role where you, you slot in and you've done it one place, you'll be successful at the other place. Uh, I think there's a lot more nuance here and a lot more opportunity as a result to help define that and needs to to support. So I think those are all great tips. I uh, would encourage anyone listening to this to reach out to Mumika if you want to deep dive more into it, because she's got some great thoughts and and uh, help you out. So um, what I want to end on for our conversation today is part of the, the intention for this series is to gain foresight into what the needs of the industry are, right? And to, to be able to see things before they happen. So uh, I would love to ask you, if you could make one prediction about the future of customer success, what would it be? This might be a scary one. Um, I think yeah. customer success is probably not going to be called customer success at some point. Okay. So um, it's probably going to be something along the lines of a consultative approach. Um, I don't know what it's going to be called, um, but really the future I feel with customer success is going to be driving value um, more like value engineering or something of that sort. Um, that's that's what I think, but we'll see. Yeah, I, I, I like that. It's something I've been thinking about and hearing is we've called it customer success for so long, but the customer success is, is oftentimes defined by the company or the vendor of the CSM when it should be customer defined success, right? The customer right. should be defining what success is. And once they do that, then a consultant or a value somebody who's supporting their journey, you know, a, a guide or, or, or what, what, call, what have you uh, is going to map better. To that. So I love that. I think I totally agree. I think it's going to be called something different and align more with, you know, what, what uh, the market yeah, actually I've is. also heard, um, I've also heard outcomes manager, which is an interesting oh, one. Cool. Like that one. Outcomes um, manager. That's cool. Yeah. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, when we got this was fantastic. I really appreciate to the opportunity to talk and share share your thoughts and, and hear what you have to say. Is there anything you wanted to end with or leave our audience with? Any any closing thoughts for you? Um, no, it's been such a pleasure. Honestly, I think what you're working on with value assessments at Foresights is amazing. Um, I feel like we we need to have more foresight into what what our customers consider valuable, um, and it would also be beneficial to them. So if you are getting into customer success, please understand what's valuable to your customer. <laughs> Don't just focus on what's internal in your company. I think that's um, that would be my closing thought there. 